If you're talking about a hot topic at home, at work, and with friends, then we want to talk about it too. In fact, every day on Equip, we're talking about current issues and how faith intersects with life. Today, I'm inviting you to become an Equipper. In this role, you'll give a monthly donation to support the ministry of Equip. And as an Equipper, I'll send you regular emails that contain brief pastoral messages prepared just for you. Become an Equipper right now by calling 888-644-4144 or go to EquipRadio.com. Well, hey there, friends. Welcome to another exciting edition of Equip with Chris Brooks. So thrilled that you've joined us today. Can you do me a favor? Strap on your seatbelt. We're going to navigate through the contours of culture, as always, with the lens of the biblical worldview on. But before we do that, let me remind you, this is the day that the Lord has made. He has given it as a gift so that you and I can rejoice and be glad in it. So let's do just that. Let's follow the words of the Apostle Paul. Let's rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Those are the words of scripture. And there are times where it may feel difficult to do, but yet God has called us to never forget that he is sovereign, all powerful, and yet all good as well. So because of his goodness, his grace, and his power, we should rejoice, regardless of the circumstances that are going on around us. Today, part of the reason for my rejoicing is because I'm so excited about the program and the guests that we get a chance to uh, discuss. Today, we're going to ask the question, if the women who followed Jesus could tell you what he was like, what would they say? You know, very often when you study church history, you hear the voice of men who have thought deeply about the ministry of Jesus, who have uh, done great research into first century believers, even the earliest followers of Jesus, and ask the question, what did they think about him? Even Jesus' own question, who do men say that I am, as he asked that broadly about those who lived during his day. But sadly, there hasn't been much scholarship, much research, much thought given to the women of Jesus's day, the women of his ministry, what they thought about him and how they can inform the way we see Jesus in our day. We know recent events have uh, once again caused there to be maybe a great divide concerning what many uh, feel about the agency and the accomplishments of women. But today on Equip, we want to celebrate their voices. And I have a resource that I think does an excellent job doing just that. It's entitled Jesus Through the Eyes of Women, How the First Female Disciples Help Us Know and Love the Lord. It is the latest by Rebecca McLaughlin. Now, those of you who have listened to the program know that Rebecca holds a Ph.D. in Renaissance Literature from Cambridge University and a theology degree from Oak Hill College in London. She is the co-founder of Vocable uh, Communications and former vice president of content for Veritas Forum, where she spent almost a decade working with Christian academics at leading secular universities. She's an accomplished author, one of my favorite guests as well. Rebecca, how are you today? I am so well and so glad to be chatting with you again, Chris. Well, you know, this book is uh, now being debuted to the world. And uh, man, what, what timing. Obviously, when you start writing a book, it is well before it hits the market. But help me to know the, the motivation, if you will, behind Jesus through the eyes of women. Part of it was honestly a selfish motivation of just wanting to spend more time in the Gospels myself and to give myself full license to do that with with all my working time. But as I was reflecting on the idea of writing this book, I was thinking, you know, it sounds like a really modern thing to do. Like, look at Jesus through the eyes of women, take the marginalized view and, and see what we see from, from that angle. But actually, if you read the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, what you'll find is that they are specifically inviting us to look at Jesus through these women's eyes. In fact, they all cite women as named eyewitnesses of Jesus's um, birth, life, death and resurrection. In fact, you know, if you look at Luke's gospel, you'll see it's women who give us all the knowledge that we have, really, about Jesus's first moments, about his conception, about his birth. 
And then in, in all four Gospels, we see Jesus being presented, uh, I'm sorry, women being presented as the key named eyewitnesses of, of the crucifixion and of the resurrection. So not just in the individual stories we see along the way in Jesus's ministries, though certainly in them, but at the kind of key pivotal moments in Jesus's life, the gospel offers us telling us to look at Jesus through the eyes of women. And so that's what I wanted to do. Um, as I look at your book, I, I, there's so many statements, Rebecca, that jump out to me, maybe the most pronounced. And I would love for you to explain what you mean by this. And you say that Jesus's treatment of women was revolutionary. Those are powerful, mm. explosive, and emotive words. What do you mean by mm. that? Today, it, pretty much everyone in our society, honestly, whatever angle they're coming from politically, would say that they believe that men and women are fundamentally morally equal. And that's one of those beliefs today that feels just like a sort of self-evident truth, like a basic moral common sense. You don't need any particular religious framework to believe that it's just you know what people obviously believe in fact if you look back in the ancient world into which christianity was born the idea that women were in fact fundamentally equal to men rather than being inferior to men was completely countercultural and if you look through jesus's teaching um both in, in what he said and in how he acted towards women you find that time and again Jesus is both saying and showing that he values women just as much as he values men. In fact, if you look through Luke's gospel in particular, and I, I called my son Luke partly for this reason, because I love Luke's gospel so much. If you look through Luke's gospel, you'll find that men and women are often paralleled in Luke. And any time there's a contrast being drawn, the woman always comes out better. <laughs> so your listeners may be familiar with the time when a, a, a sinful woman of the city comes in while Jesus yeah. is having dinner with this guy, Simon the Pharisee. And she's crying on Jesus' feet, wa washing them with her tears, wiping them with her hair, um, anointing them. And the, the Pharisee, the sort of powerful, um, religiously impressive man, is disgusted. He's like, if Jesus was a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this is. He was touching him. The implication being he would want no nothing to do with her. And Jesus takes this moment and he actually holds this woman up who has been described as quite a sinful woman of the city. We don't know exactly what that means. She could have been a prostitute, could have been other forms of sin, but she is sort of known as a sinner and, and weeping on his feet, pouring out her love for him. Jesus holds her up as a, a moral example, an example of love to shame this self-righteous man. <laughs> it's just one of the moments where we see Jesus yeah. not only defending a woman against an attack from a man, but actually kind of holding her up um, and welcoming her um, when he's he's showing that the, the man is, in fact, kind of failing to recognize who he is. What do we miss when we read stories like the story of Mary and Martha? I, I've heard that preached so often. I've preached it many times throughout my ministry. But what is so, to use your word, revolutionary about what we see in Mary, who so often is uh, the bad actor in that in that <laughs> narrative by some? Some explain her to be the um, irresponsible sister who was the bad actor. What are we missing when we see that story? I mean, what I love is there are actually two stories of Mary, Martha, and Bethany, one in, um, one in Luke's gospel and, and one in John's gospel, actually a couple in John's gospel. But in Luke in particular, what you're referring to there is you know, Mary sitting at Jesus's feet and learning from him while Martha is is sort of serving and complains to Jesus. Like, who does my sister think she is? Tell her to get up and, and help. She's leaving me to do all the work. And Jesus affirms Mary's choice to learn from him and to sit at his feet, which is where disciples would sit. Um, he, he says that she has chosen the better portion or the kind of better meal than even what Martha is, is trying to serve and validates her as a disciple. And, and one of the really fun things that I sort of dug into more working on this book was the fact that women were in fact fully fledged disciples of Jesus. We often hear about the, the 12 apostles who were sometimes called the 12 disciples. And obviously they're an important and unique group um, chosen by Jesus to sort of replicate the 12 tribes of, of Israel. But actually the gospels are clear and Luke in particular is clear in, in chapter eight, that there were also women who traveled with Jesus among his disciples and were in every sense sort of formal disciples of Jesus. So when we hear, when we talk about Jesus' disciples, we need to be careful to not only think of the 12 apostles, but also to think of the, the women 
who traveled with him, some of whom Luke in particular yeah. names as eyewitnesses of his ministry. You know, I, I just want to say that for, for um, reasons that are beyond my ability to comprehend, the theological training of women has been, in some uh, uh, circles of uh, Christianity, has uh, maybe been diminished or uh, looked at through a critical eye. But I would simply want to affirm today that this, uh, what you're sharing with us now, is in part re- w- one of the reasons why we need to encourage and advocate for women to know the gospel well, to uh, be theologically trained so they they can help us to be able to uh, understand and serve our Lord more faithfully. And, and I'm grateful for that. But I'd love to, with about a minute left before we have to go to break, uh, just hear you respond to this. You know, so often I, um, in advocating for Christianity, will look at like the Heritage Institute's Freedom Index for countries that are the most free by several measurements. And one of the things that it reveals, Rebecca, is that where Christianity has been, typically the rights of women go up. Uh, Mm -hmm, But yet, mm -hmm. um, so often that's not how Christianity is viewed. You say, while at Cambridge University, you talk to women who often saw uh, Christianity as misogynistic and antithetical to the rights and freedoms of women. How does that Mm -hmm. happen when the evidence at least on a national level, shows that in nations where Christianity has flourished, so have the rights of women. Yeah, I mean, some of it, and I I want to be clear to sort of own our history of sin as Christians as well. There are so many ways in which the Christians actually haven't lived up to the ethics of of Jesus. And this is one area where truly you can see misogynistic and hateful and demeaning behavior um, towards women throughout the history of the church. But as as you point out, it's actually Christian ethics that gives us the foundation for women's rights and equality mm. and the protections that women enjoy today in countries where Christianity has been at least you know, significantly able to, to till the moral soil. So when we compare places where Christianity has been at least to a significant degree setting the agenda, albeit often extre- extremely imperfectly, thanks to our, our Christian sin, um, we do see that this really benefits women. What has drawn women to Christianity from the first century until now? What can we learn about the way that Jesus viewed women and the way that women viewed Jesus? Well, this newest book by Rebecca McLaughlin uh, helps us to see Jesus through the eyes of women. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to delve deeper into the book to ask Uh, some really pointed questions about uh, the role that women played in the ministry of Jesus and how he responded to them as well. I want to give you an opportunity to get your hands on a copy of this book by going to our website. Please visit today, equipradio.org. That's equipradio.org. Click on today's program details. And when you do, you'll see how to order a copy of Jesus Through the Eyes of Women, how the first century, the first rather female disciples help us know and love the Lord. Don't go anywhere. Much more to come next up on Equip with Chris Brooks. This daily program is fully devoted to coming alongside listeners like you to give you the tools needed for a successful walk with God. As one of our loyal listeners, would you be willing to become an equipper? Your monthly contribution will be applied to equipping others all across the country. Plus, as an equipper, I'll send you regular emails that contain brief pastoral messages prepared just for you. To become an equipper now, call 888-644-4144 or go online to equipradio.org. Welcome back to Equip with Chris Brooks. So grateful for those of you who support the program. Without your generosity, we couldn't be here each and every day to equip Christians to more effectively live, share, and defend their faith. I want to encourage you, if you have been listening and been blessed by the program, to consider partnering with us today. Your generous tax-deductible gift enables us to spread the gospel in your community, to shine bright the light of the goodness of God's grace. You can find out more by dialing the number 
888-644-4144. That's 888-644-4144. Rebecca, as we uh, continue our conversation about Jesus through the eyes of women, your newest book, newest project, uh, there is a um, uh, a question that maybe undergirds all of this conversation. Most of your research uh, comes from your examination of the Gospels. So it begs the question, can we trust the Gospels? It does indeed. And actually, that's where, where I start the book. There's a interesting uh, document that has come to be known as um, the Gospel of Mary, although that's not the sort of title given given in the document at all which as far as experts can um, can tell, was written in the sort of mid-second century, uh, so well after the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life had, had all died. And texts like this and some other sort of so-called Gnostic Gospels, um, which were also tend to be written rather later uh, than the original um, four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, people will, will look at texts like this and say, well, how do we know that we're actually getting the authentic life of Jesus from these four New Testament Gospels. In particular, why would we trust four Gospels that were written by men? Um, Aren't they just sort of stifling a a potentially more feminist view of who Jesus is? And there are multiple problems with that line of thinking. One is, as I I said, just the dating of these texts, which is um, later than than the New Testament Gospels. And from any reasonable historical perspective, it would make more sense to trust documents written based on eyewitness testimony from people who are still alive, who, who traveled with Jesus and, and saw what he did and, and heard what he said, than people who are writing sort of well after the fact. We also find that if you, if you look carefully um, and compare the later sort of so-called gospels to the, the New Testament gospels, the picture of women that we get in the New Testament gospels is often actually far, far more positive than we get in the, the so-called Gnostic gospels. Um, not least because the, the New Testament Gospels are capturing eyewitness testimony of women and they're showing us the ways that Jesus um, loved and valued and, and elevated and affirmed women. So this idea that uh, there, there are sort of alternative, more um, pro-women Gospels that have been sidelined um, in church history is doesn't actually stand up. Um, one of the almost kind of funny uh, things when you, when you think about it, if you read through the the four gospels with um, with the idea that these texts have been maybe um, edited for political reasons by church leaders who are wanting to promote a certain kind of view of themselves to their own political ends, which is an argument people sometimes make. Now, if that's true, then they did a terrible job. Um, the portrayal of the, the early church leaders, so in particular Peter, who went on to be one of the key leaders in the early Christian movement and the other apostles as well, their portrayal in the gospels is extremely embarrassing. Um, you know, poor Peter, you have him uh, right after he's acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ. You, you hear Jesus calling him Satan because he's trying to talk Jesus out of the cross. Yeah. You hear Peter saying to Jesus that he's willing to die with him. And Jesus saying, no way, you're actually going to deny you even know me three times before the night is out. Peter says, you're wrong. And then we see Peter doing exactly that. So I- I- if anybody could have influenced the message um, because of their power in the early church, Peter was the guy. And instead, he allowed um, all the Gospels, and in particular, Mark's Gospel, which experts think was based on Peter's testimony in particular, he he allows them to portray him as a total spiritual loser Mm. um, and and to portray women as, as I mentioned earlier, the the first witnesses of the resurrection, which in, in first century cultural terms would not have been a choice that anyone trying to persuade others of an incredible thing sure. having happened would make um, the testimony of women was not seen as as um, credible. So the fact that all four Gospels show us women as the first witnesses of the resurrection actually speaks to their authenticity. You know, it's interesting because that uh, approach of looking at the things that aren't flattering or would not have been viewed as flattering as justification for the authentic nature of the Gospels, the veracity of the Gospels may be new to some, uh, but I think it's an excellent way to approach this question. Assuming then that, that your argument is is correct, that the Gospels are trustworthy, then we need to delve into what they actually reveal to us about the role of women in the ministry and life of Jesus. And one of the areas that you unpack really well, brilliantly, 
is the prophecy that marks the life of Jesus. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of Luke 2, 36, mm. uh, uh, where uh, we read these words. There was also a prophet, Anna, uh, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. Scripture goes on to say she never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying, coming up to them, referring to Mary and Joseph at the very moment, referring to Jesus' birth, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Those are powerful words, a pivotal Mm -hmm. moment in the life and ministry of Jesus. What does that give us a broader window window to concerning prophecy in Jesus? Yeah, I actually, I love the story of Anna that we get a a little snippet of there. Um, In the first chapter of my book is is called Prophecy, and it's looking in particular at the three women who Luke um, calls attention to at the beginning of his gospel, which is um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Elizabeth, John the, the John the Baptist's mother, and then this this woman um, Anna from the tribe of Asher, who's described as a prophetess. And if you look at how um, Luke presents each of these women, you see Elizabeth being filled with the Holy Spirit when Mary walks into her house. Um, you know, the infant John the Baptist kind of leaps in her womb. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and given prophetic words to speak to Mary um, about who Jesus is and and about what's what's going on. So we see Elizabeth sort of prophesying i mean not even sort of specifically prophesying uh, and then we see mary um responding with the extraordinary kind of song of, of praise or poem of praise that um that she produces that's become you know incredibly famous sometimes known as the magnificat and is one of the longest and most beautiful speeches made by anybody in the gospels other than jesus and jesus uh, you know after he's been born being brought to the temple and, and meeting this woman who is described as a prophetess and if you think in, in chronological terms, she is the first officially recognized prophet since the last Old Testament prophet at this point. And he's speaking before John the Baptist was speaking, you know, when John the Baptist was still in diapers, as it were, or first, the first century equivalent. Here we have this, this woman um, prophesying about Jesus. So we see how, how God is, is weaving women into um, Jesus' life, not, not just as the mothers of key um, men like Jesus and, and latterly sort of secondarily John John the Baptist, but also as people who are, who are given insight about um, what God is doing in the world to speak today. And I love how Luke just allows us into those conversations so we can hear it. So much that we can learn from those conversations, but I think it helps us to understand how powerfully Jesus used women, Rebecca, just in announcing who he w- was, what he had come to do, and uh, the role that he would play in the redemptive plan that was laid before the foundations of the world. I love this chapter on nourishment, and maybe it's because I love to eat and drink too much. Uh, but I love that you titled the chapter Nourishment, where you really took seriously what seems to be on the surface uh, easily overlooked social moments that were actually Mm. powerful in the life of Jesus. Can you just share briefly about these moments at Wells and at Meal? Mm. One of my favorite stories in in John's gospel, and I know I'm not the only only one with this feeling, is Jesus's conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, where he asks her for a drink and then offers her living water. This is the longest private recorded conversation we have from Jesus in any of the gospels, which is sort of extraordinary in itself, Jesus is talking with a, not just with a woman, but with a, a Samaritan woman. And, and it's hard for us today to kind of feel the, the force of that because you and I were not raised to hate the Samaritans. But Jesus of Jesus' day were raised to hate the Samaritans. Sure. And so this is Jesus kind of cutting across um, the, the, the male-female barrier, um, talking with a, a Samaritan woman who he, he shouldn't have been talking with at all, let alone sort of sharing a drinking vessel with, which she points out when he asks her for a drink. And what's more, as the conversation proceeds, we find that Jesus knew from the first that this woman had a very sexually compromised history. Um, she's, she's had five husbands and she's now living with a man who, who she's not married to. And Jesus chooses to have his longest private recorded conversation um, with this woman. 
And at the end, this is something that I only kind of discovered in the course of, of writing this book. Famously, at the end of that conversation, she st- says to him, um, I know that when Messiah comes, he is called the Christ. He will explain everything to us. And Jesus says, I am the one speaking to you. Now, famously, this is the first time in John's gospel when Jesus specifically reveals himself as the Christ, God's promised king. But it's also, and this is what I hadn't realized before, it's also one of Jesus's I am statements. So again, famously in John's gospel, Jesus will make statements like, I, you know, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Yes. I am the resurrection and the life, sort of channeling the um, covenant name of God from the Old Testament that c- can be translated as I am who I am. And here Jesus says to this woman, I am the one speaking to you. So what do we learn about the great creator God from this interaction? We learn that he is the the kind of God who wants to spend his time with sexually compromised foreign women. It's just, it's incredible. Yeah, and that he speaks, that he's a God who speaks, and he does not just speak to the perfect. He does not just Mm. speak to those with titles. He doesn't just speak to those who have clergy office or positions. Maybe you feel like you are compromised because of your sin. Please know that our God is a God of mercy, of grace, a God of redemption, who calls even sinners like you and me to come and taste and see that he is good, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Don't go anywhere. Rebecca has much more for us on the other side of this break. Next up on Equip. Welcome back to Equip with Chris Brooks. So grateful today to have a conversation about uh, a book that debuts to the world today. It's entitled Jesus Through the Eyes of Women, How the First Female Disciples Help Us Know and Love the Lord by Rebecca McLaughlin, her her, uh, newest volume for us. I highly encourage you to uh, add this to your study. If you are a person who takes the gospel seriously, but you're also, if you're a Christian who wants to speak effectively concerning Christianity in today's culture, you need to read this. We all know that Christianity is becoming more and more characterized by those who uh, are critics of the, the ministry of Christians, often because of our own failures legitimately, but some because of a misrepresentation of our Lord. And what I uh, long to do is to make sure that we uh, understand and know the word rightly so that we can know the Lord rightly. Uh, Rebecca is with us today. And Rebecca, when we went to our last break, uh, we just, uh, I think, landed on a sweet point. And that is that God does not just deal with those who um, seem, at least externally, uh, to be pretty people or people with unblemished records. And I'm certainly glad that that's true, uh, because if he only did deal with perfect people, then I would be on the outside looking in. Uh, But we can tell from the record of his dealings with uh, fallen men and broken women that God is a God who speaks to the broken and who welcomes the sinner. That's encouraging, isn't it? It is. I mean, I'd almost go further, Chris, and I expect you would as well. Jesus um, told the Pharisees who were complaining that he was sort of hanging out with sinners. He said, oh, oh um, it's only the sick you need a doctor, not the well. I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners. If we're not sinners, we don't need Jesus. Um, and the Pharisees didn't think that they were sinners. Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious to us as readers that they are falsely um, yeah. reflecting on who they are and they actually need him desperately but they don't realize it because they don't know how sinful they are so jesus is only here for sinners only here for failures only here for the kind of morally bankrupt folks in town and it takes us realizing that that's us for us to come and throw ourselves down at his feet which is what so many women did you have an entire chapter dedicated to the thought of forgiveness and um just mm. thinking deeply rebecca about who Jesus forgave. I think that um, it should humble us all. And even in an hour in which we uh, should boldly affirm our convictions concerning uh, the words of Jesus, even the exclusive claims of Jesus, we should never speak the truth in a loveless way 
or present the truth in a graceless way. Truth always comes wrapped in grace. It's always Mm -hmm. delivered in uh, words of love when it comes from the lips of our Savior. And so I'm grateful that you included this chapter on forgiveness. I think what surprised me, though, is what I learned about um, Jesus's healing ministry and what that teaches us about um, the way he viewed and valued women. Talk mm-hmm. about his his healing ministry. What what caused you to focus on that? Mm, yeah, I mean, there's so many beautiful stories of Jesus healing women. Um, and two of them kind of come all wrapped up together. Um, I don't know, Chris, if you know the, the Sam Cooke song, um, Touch the Hem of His Garment. Have you ever yes, come yes. across that song? I, I won't yes. try to sing it because I, I couldn't do it justice. <laughs> um, but it, it's it's beautiful, and I commend your, your listeners to to look it up. Um, it's It's talking from the perspective of a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. Um, and bleeding in the sense of sort of me- menstrual bleeding. Um, so she had been uh, very sick. She mm-hmm. had been um, ceremonially unclean for that long. She very likely had been infertile. She'd been very mm-hmm. likely kind of marginalized in society because even Social touching outcasts. her, yeah. yeah, even touching her could could make other people unclean. And she comes up to Jesus in a crowd <clears throat> and thinks to herself, and we get this beautiful glimpse of what she's thinking, which is, rare in the gospels we get to sort of specifically see through her eyes she says if i could touch even the hem of his garment i know i'd be made whole and she comes up to jesus and touches him and she's immediately healed and um jesus says wait a minute wait a minute somebody somebody touched me who's touching me and his disciples are like what are you talking about we're in the middle of a crowd everyone like everyone's rubbing up against everybody else why are you asking who touched me and he said no 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 somebody touched me i felt the power go out of me and he has this woman come before him and she is trembling and afraid, like kneeling down at his feet because she thinks she's about to be, presumably she thinks she's about to be severely rebuked. Like, what does she think she was doing? She, she shouldn't be going around touching people, let alone this great rabbi. And Jesus welcomes her and he calls her his daughter. Mm-hmm. In fact, she's the only person in the Gospels who Jesus addresses as daughter. And I was sort of reflecting on that, thinking, you know, if, of course she has the right to touch him. She's his daughter. <laughs> um, obviously not in a kind of literal yeah. biological sense, but in, in terms of, of relationship, she is his, his daughter. And she's come to him exactly as we should when we've run out of other options. Um, she's spent all her money on, on doctors and, and they hadn't made her better, only worse. She's desperate. And that's why she comes to Jesus. And that's precisely where he welcomes her. But one of the, the most stunning things about this story is it actually kind of happens in the middle of another story so the synagogue ruler called Jairus has has come to Jesus and said you know please come my daughter is very sick Um, but if you come and touch her I know she'll be she'll be made well so Jesus said on his way to Jairus's house when this woman touches him and kind of distracts him from where he was going and then right after her healing the messengers come from Jairus's house and they say your daughter's died don't bother the teacher anymore so you're thinking, well, wait a minute, um, you know, is Jesus going to be annoyed at this point that the woman wasted his time? Like, couldn't she have waited? She'd been bleeding for 12 years. Why not 12 years and a few hours more? So he could have got to heal this other girl. But no, Jesus just says to, to Jairus, um, don't be afraid, only believe. And he goes there, um, puts all the crowd outside, goes in um, with the, the little girl who was 12 years old, um, parents and his three closest disciples. And he says to her in Aramaic, which was their shared mother tongue, um, Talitha Kumi, I say to you, little girl, get up. And he takes her by the hand and lifts her up and she comes back to life. So we see in this kind of um, double healing story, we see a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, who Jesus recognizes as his daughter and heals. And we see a 12-year-old little girl who's dead and who Jesus calls back to life with those tender words in their shared mother tongue. Um, Jesus healed hundreds, perhaps thousands of people in the course of his ministry. So every time the gospel authors are telling us particular stories, there's a reason for it. And there is so much tenderness and meaning that we can see in this story. Rebecca, there, you know, this is so profound to me on so many levels. I just want to mention two. One is identity. Um, I, mm. There's much about identity in Christ that's being written now and uh, much of it good but I think so often when we think of our brokenness, 
uh, we just simply identify with the fact that we're fallen sinners and we are mm-hmm. fallen sinners, but we don't think of Jesus calling out to hurting wounded women as daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and in a culture that objectifies women so often, that devalues women, that causes them to often not feel like daughters, to hear mm. the, that that um, title uh, from the lips of Jesus is such a powerful and healing word. But mm. also, I, there's another point that jumps out to me, and that is it's okay for us to petition the master for healing. It's yeah. okay for us to pray to the master, to the Lord for healing. Uh, yeah. Because these chapters of our Bibles are given to us to, uh, I think, encourage us in our faith that not only is he Lord of all, uh, Lord of the winds and the waves, Lord of all nature and creation, even uh, Lord and authority over all humanity, not only is he powerful enough to do it, he desires to do it. And and that's, mm-hmm. to me... The beautiful part, Rebecca. Yeah, and I, I feel like I, I can barely write a book without writing about um, Mary and Martha of Bethany and, and John 11 when they do call for, for Jesus for healing because their brother Lazarus is very sick and and he deliberately doesn't come. Uh, and John is so clear. He says that Jesus loved Mary, Martha and their brother and so he stayed where he was. And you think, well, wait a minute, that makes no sense. Surely if he loved them, he would have come. Yeah. Or if he, you know, maybe he didn't care that much. He had other things to do, so he didn't bother. But he, he loved them, and so they didn't. He didn't come. He lets Lazarus die, and then he goes and he has this stunning conversation with Martha, in which he declares that he is the resurrection and the life. That what she needs most needs is actually not her brother healed. What she most needs is him. Mm. And and after that moment, which he's kind of created the space for by not healing Lazarus to begin with, um, he weeps with the sisters as they mourn. And then he calls Lazarus out of the grave. And and to me, that makes so much sense of the times when we call out to the Lord and it feels like he hasn't yes. answered. You know, when we're sick or when the, those we love are dying and we pray and pray and pray and he doesn't, he doesn't come through for us. It's not because he doesn't love us. It's because he is the one who, who has the power to not only be with us in our suffering, but actually to call us and, and, and those we love who put their trust in him back from the grave as well. So I think it just makes sense of both... Jesus's tenderness and love for us and the fact that we should call out to him in suffering and should pray for healing, but also the fact that ultimately our healing will come after we've died and when he calls us out of, out of our graves. I think by now, if you've been listening either for the entire conversation or you've only been able to take in a segment or so, you're seeing clearly why this book is a gift uh, to us, in particular in this moment of our church uh, history, in this moment of our uh, social discourse. Jesus through the eyes of women. I would uh, encourage you to add it to your library now and to begin to read its pages. It is full of truth. It is, again, wrapped in grace, and it will awaken your heart to see Jesus in the way that I believe the gospel writers intended for us to see Jesus. We're going to take our final break of the day. But remember, these breaks are only opportunities provided to us for you to get a copy of the book to learn more about the guests and about the resource. Uh, Maybe you're just being introduced to Rebecca's ministry. There's much more uh, for you to learn. I would highly commend to you uh, Confronting Christianity, the Secular Creed, and Is Christmas Believable? Some of her other works while you're adding Jesus Through the Eyes of Women to your library. And oh, by the way, this is also a great book to read in a, in a life group form, in a small group form. Maybe you have other people that you're in a study group with Read it together. There are discussion questions. It will be richly edifying to your heart. We're going to come back and land this plane in the heart of the gospel, I promise, right after this. How well do you forgive? 
We all want to live in harmony, but forgiving others can be complicated. Today, I want to equip you with a book that will help you to learn to forgive, find peace, and move forward even when it's hard. It's called I Forgive You by Wendy Alsop, and you can request your copy today when you support Equip with a gift of any amount. Simply call 888-644-4144 or go to EquipRadio.org. Welcome back to Equip with Chris Brooks. Such a rich and edifying conversation with Rebecca McLaughlin on her new book, Jesus Through the Eyes of Women. And uh, Rebecca, I don't know if you predicted the timing of this book, but if if you could have predicted it, I don't think it could have been a better time. Uh, obviously, God's providence oversees all of these uh, types of projects, but this book is so timely as I reflect on our national discourse right now. Um, Let's talk about the gospel writers. You know, they could have followed the, um, I guess, the flow of their day and uh, just simply relied on the testimony of men. Uh, It is, uh, it would have been altogether consistent with the cultural norms that they have been raised in if we would have read the Gospels, and the only thing we had was the testimony of men. What does it tell you uh, when you read the Gospels and you see them so heavily reliant on the testimony of women from Anna at his birth all the way to uh, the first proclamation of the empty tomb and the risen Savior? Mm. You know, it's funny. um, If you sat down with the text of all the Gospels, and um, you crossed out things that were only witnessed by men, you'd lose like a teeny bit. You know, you'd likely lose the transfiguration when Jesus was up on the mountain and sort of revealed in his glory and, and Peter made kind of a dumb comment. You know, you'd, the little snippets you'd lose. If you cut out all the things that were only witnessed by women, you'd actually lose some pretty substantial things like the um, message about Jesus's birth um, and the, the prophecies that, that surrounded Jesus's birth from Mary and, and Elizabeth and Anna, um, like the, the first witnessing of the, the tomb and the first meetings with the resurrected Jesus. I'm not suggesting that we you know, have to choose between the testament of men and women in the scriptures. Um, but even honestly, even if you only kept things that were witnessed by women called Mary, <laughs> you'd keep the vast majority of the gospels Uh, because Mary was the most common name among Jewish women in that time and place. And so the the Gospels are absolutely full of of Marys who are uh, watching what Jesus does and and interacting with him. Um, So, yeah, we get get to see Jesus through the eyes of women as we read the Gospels, which is is sort of beautiful and and stunning. But it also tells you, I think, something about what they must have learned from the Lord. You know, for them to follow this path, of not only being historically responsible and upholding truth, even if it was an embarrassing truth, but also uh, seeing as credible uh, the voice of women, to me, that gives us some insight into what um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John um, at least learn uh, about the ministry of Jesus. Yeah, although they were slow learners and, and bless them, they are willing to acknowledge that. There's this one of the embarrassing moments in Luke's gospel is when the, the women who have seen Jesus's empty tomb go back and tell the apostles that Jesus has risen from the dead. And Luke says it seemed to them an idle tale and they didn't believe it. You know, these, these are the guys they've, they've traveled with these women for years. Uh, they really should at this point trust what they have to say. And yet the apostles didn't didn't believe uh, what what the women said so we see that kind of cultural resistance but then of course we see it overpowered by the the truth of what the women were saying we see even those embarrassing moments um sort of kept for us in the testimony which i think points to the um the the true transformation that that happened in in the hearts of um the the men who were uh, jesus's disciples because they were willing to to show their failures along the way and, and point to the beauty of jesus Rebecca, let's fast forward this uh, this conversation to our current hour, our current day. Uh, it's so important for women to bear witness uh, to Jesus, to his life, to, to his death, burial, and resurrection. 
still, isn't it? Mm. Yes. And uh, for the last 2000 years, that's exactly what women have been doing. And um, people sometimes think that Christianity is sort of male centered and, and misogynistic. In actual fact, the church has always been majority female. This is true as far as we can discern from historical records of the the early church. Um, it, it's true today, not just in the US, but actually globally. Um, it's true in China today, which is is fast um, becoming one of the, the kind of fastest growing Christian movements in the world. Um, likely will have more Christians in China than in America in the next few years. And the church there is majority female. So if Christianity is, as, as so many of our contemporaries think, you know, profoundly anti-women, it, it's mighty odd that so many women flock to Jesus, um, and they always have. Our good friend Sam Alberry says this about your book, Jesus Through the Eyes of Women. He says, with uh, insight and inspiration on every page, Rebecca shows us the real Jesus in all of his tenderness, majesty, compassion, and defiance. Essential and wonderful reading. I think uh, that is well stated by Sam, and I concur. Rebecca, thank you for this uh, this project. I guess a concluding, maybe quick word on what your hope is for those who read it. Yeah, my hope is, and, and to be clear, this is a book not just for women. It's it's for men and women, anyone who wants to just sure. dig more into the Gospels. My hope is that we'll all love Jesus more um, from reading it. it it's, um, it's written sort of primarily for believers, though I hope it would be helpful to, to curious non-believers as well. But that's really my hope is to to see Jesus through these these women's eyes. Um, it's not it's not a book primarily about women. It's a book primarily about Jesus. But when we look at Jesus, um, everything changes, including how we see our brothers and sisters in Christ. Rebecca, thank you for taking out an hour of your time to be with us today on Equip. We continue to pray for your ministry, for your family, and we will pray that God uses this wonderful project. Jesus through the eyes of women to draw many to himself. God bless, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Chris. Folks, I want to encourage you, commend you again to go to our website, equipradio.org. There you can find out more about Rebecca and about the book, Jesus through the eyes of women. Good reading for both men and women. And until we're together again next time, as always, remember, Equip with Chris Brooks is a production of Moody Radio, a ministry of Moody Bible Institute. Carlos is a Marine who left for Afghanistan confident in his Christian faith. Rosemarie is a wife who faithfully prayed that he would come home safely. Instead, he returned with a broken body and a shattered spirit, like so many others who served our nation. This is Chris Brooks. Please join me for a story of an amazing couple who found a faith that heals on a special edition of Equip. Listen live weekdays at 1 Eastern, noon Central, on the Moody Radio app or equipradio.org.